Good afternoon everyone, my name is Leo and I am the Senior Executive here at Sarcoidosis UK. Thank you so much for joining us today for the Royal Brompton Cardiac Sarcoidosis Team's virtual meeting. Now this is going to be a virtual meeting for cardiac sarcoidosis patients in the COVID-19 era. Now I think it's important to say whilst this is an event for cardiac sarcoidosis patients, I'm sure there will be lots of useful information for patients with other sarcoidosis involvement as well. So do stay tuned even if you are not necessarily a cardiac sarcoidosis patient. Now the meeting is due to start at 2.30pm so in about 5 minutes time and it will last for just over an hour. Now I've just had a look at the meeting agenda and I know that some of the topics that are going to be discussed today include um, sarcoidosis and COVID-19, so what are the current risks and are there any current updates that we need to know about. Then there will also be a specific section on cardiac sarcoidosis and COVID-19 and a bit later on they will also be discussing COVID-19 vaccines as well, which I know is a topic that is on all of our minds at the moment. Um, now speaking at this virtual meeting today will be Dr Karanos who is a member of the amazing Sarcoidosis UK Clinical Board and he will also be joined by Professor Wells, Dr Sharma, Dr Jose and Professor Doran too. And I think that's everyone but if I've left anyone off that list I am really sorry. Um, now with this being an event that we're live streaming from a separate Teams meeting we won't be able to take questions live on Facebook, Twitter and YouTube in the way that we usually do. Um, but if you do have questions about anything that comes up um, or you do have any questions about the COVID-19 vaccines or just general coronavirus questions, please do leave us a comment um, on the video and we will add it as a question. Uh, we'll add it to the list of questions for our next Q&A video. Now our next Q&A session will be on the 9th of March at 2 p.m. with the brilliant Dr. Rubina Coker and she will be answering questions that have been put to us by sarcoidosis patients about the COVID-19 vaccine. Um, so if you do have any questions about the COVID-19 vaccines, just leave us a comment on this video and we will add them to the list for Dr. Coker. Um, if you would like to catch up on any of our previous COVID-19 Q&A videos, they are all available to watch on our COVID-19 webpage and the URL for that is www.sarcoidosisuk.org forward slash coronavirus. Um, and on that coronavirus webpage, you'll find lots of useful resources and information about coronavirus, specifically for sarcoidosis patients. So please do check that out. It now includes a new vaccines FAQ page um, where you can also submit questions if you don't, if we don't, haven't already answered them on the FAQ. Now, before I connect us to the live stream of the meeting, um, I would like to ask anybody who is able to, to consider making a donation to Sarcoidosis UK. The last year has been incredibly difficult for so many people, um, but it's been a particularly challenging time for the charity sector and for people with sarcoidosis. Um, despite all of that, we are still working incredibly hard and we are incredibly motivated to continue funding research into a cure and supporting sarcoidosis patients. So if you are able to, please visit www.sarcoidosisuk.org forward slash donate and donate whatever you can, no matter how big or small, every little really does help. Um, and that will allow us to continue funding research into a cure and supporting sarcoidosis patients who, who need our support now more than ever. Um, I would also like to take this opportunity to say a massive thank you to anybody who has donated or fundraised for us in the last year. Um, it is extremely appreciated and we are incredibly grateful. Um, and your support has allowed us to continue doing our vital work. Um, but anyway, back to the video. We are really excited for this uh, live stream today. Um, I am going to put you on the hold screen again just for a couple of minutes. Um, well, one minute while I set up the live stream. Um, so you've got a quick chance to go and make a cup of tea if you want to. Um, and we'll be back in a minute or two with the live stream for, from the um, virtual meeting for cardiac sarcoidosis patients in the COVID-19 era. I will see you very shortly.
you. That's okay. I think, Facilis, if it's all right with you, I'll press the record button. Um, and I'm, I'm just going to sort of double sort of reiterate. If people are not speaking, please turn off your microphones. It just means that it's a better sound quality for everyone and their recording will be um, much much more useful for people once it's um, posted um, online. Um, if you're joining us, please turn off your cameras as well, um, so otherwise your images will be all over the internet and we'd rather not have that if you don't mind. Um, so yeah, thank you so much. And you as well, Bill, if you can just like sort of hide your camera, that'd be great. Um, and I'll just start the um, recording shortly and you'll see the red light at the top, Facilis, and then I'm gonna, then if I can just hand over to you, that'd be great. Thank you so much. Leo, are you ready to go live from South Wales, UK? Thank you everyone for attending uh, to this uh, patient stay. Um, as the cardiac sarcoidosis team is present, uh, Professor Wells, Dr. Sam and myself, um, along with all the team uh, working for imaging and uh, nursing staff, we would like to thank you for attending. Uh, we have a plan to make these events as, uh, as often as you would like, so you would be asked at the end of the um, meeting to provide us your views. I would just start by um, telling you a few things about our um, about our session. So I would welcome after this brief introduction Professor Wells who would uh, discuss about the risk of uh, sarcoidosis against COVID-19 infection. Dr. Sama will comment on the cardiac aspect and whether there are any risk for uh, complications if you have an already, already known myocardial damage. I would like to thank Dr. Ricardo Jose, who's uh, our consultant respiratory physician with expertise in host defense and infectious disease, who is going to share his knowledge about the, vac the COVID-19 vaccination program. Um, also, Professor Darren, who is a leading physician in allergy in the country, but also internationally, will um, comment on the allergy side of things related to the vaccines. And I will finish by um, telling you a few things about our service and um, what can we do to uh, improve things with your input. Um, so, without, without further ado, I would um, ask Professor Wells to uh, give us his talk. Prof, if you can share your screen. And then you Statistic, can you see my screen now? Yes. Good. So I'm going to keep this short in the two minutes because short. the key is uh, patient discussion. I make a particular request though that anyone with their microphone on mutes it because I'm getting echoes. So this is an update and First of all, Vassilis sent out to you this questionnaire as background to this. And what you see is that you as a group of attendees have a positivity test rate for COVID-19 of less than 10% during this crisis. Now keep in mind that when you've got test positivity, you are breaking this down into asymptomatic disease, 
a mild version, something like the flu, and then you've got to think about hospital admission as a marker for bad disease, and this informs what I have to say from here. Now, just to summarise my last talk in the slide, we began with the view of fearing for our patients with sarcoid. Age was less of an issue, but if you consider some of the other illnesses, often going with too much steroid therapy and too high a dose for too long, then if you have severe disease, you've got less reserve. If you think about it, if your lungs are damaged, you're starting at a lower point, and therefore a moderate infection for somebody with normal lungs is going to be challenging if you've got less normal lung to fall back on. Then there was this view of immunosuppressive therapy might be an issue. And then there was speculation about the problem of having sarcoid activity and the virus triggering flare. However, what I did say last time is that there was accumulating evidence that there was surprisingly little severe COVID considering our concerns in people with sarcoid. And let me be clear, I'm not telling you that if you have sarcoid, you have a lower risk of severe disease than in the general population. This simply is known. I can speculate on that, but it's speculation. What I'm saying is, logic seems to indicate the risk should be higher, and very much higher, maybe. But this doesn't seem to be so, and what I can now give you is a questionnaire-based evaluation driven from the United States. And I think I've just got two more slides before I go to the questions. So I think this is very helpful. You've got to keep in mind questionnaires. You can ask some things, and they don't work for other things. But you can see you're talking about a very large population of sarcoid patients. I don't read too much into what they've called controls uh, of breast cancer cohort. We, we don't know that breast cancer increases COVID risk, so uh, maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. And so uh, I, I guess that as controls, it's not so helpful. But what can we say? Well, firstly, keep in mind, if you look at the countries, that in two of them, it, there was a pandemic early on, and you're talking about before lockdown came in, especially in Italy. So if you were really going to see a huge hit rate in sarcoid from COVID, this really ought to come through. And then just look at the actual figures, 2.2% of 5,200 patients had COVID. Now, immediately that tells you that the idea that to have sarcoid because you have to increase the risk of catching the infection. Prof. The message that came up, somebody in the meeting muted me. <laughs> So I'm not sure what it was. When did you lose me? I said my bit about the breast cancer cohort, had I? Yes, yeah. yes. Good. And the rate of infection being only 2.2%. Yes. Uh, so, so I think the really important thing is three people in the thousand out of every thousand in this cohort got hospitalized from COVID. And that is the heart figure, hospitalisation. See, the trouble is rate of infection, it depends if you go off and get tested. Uh, there's all sorts of variables in different countries as to what your threshold is of infecting people, but to get hospitalised is hard data. And I think the, risk, the issue is not the rate of having COVID, but the rate of having dangerous COVID. And they did break down, and this is really important, whether there was a risk factor or more than one risk factor for actually winding up in hospital uh, with COVID. And the only thing they could find was to have cardiac disease. And this is not cardiac sarcoid, this is cardiac disease in all its forms. It will be dominated by skin heart disease. 
was the only risk factor for hospital admission. There was no risk associated with immunosuppression. Other health problems and diagnoses, there wasn't a link to patient perceived severity of sarcoid, but that's very loose. You can't do that in the questionnaire. What you can do is patterns of sarcoid involvement. So from this, I don't want to be complacent. It is still Vitamin D can cause 
problems and start querying. I don't think there's enough there at this stage that we should be uh, risking the problems that can be caused by the vitamin D in sarcoid. And I would urge you to view sarcoid patients uh, to have sarcoid as something that should make you think twice before following that advice. Sorry about the long answer, but it is, I think, a really important question. Fastest, I think you have one other thing. Yeah, um, so um, I think there's one question basically with two arms. Um, the first yeah. question, yeah. The, first, the, the one aspect is with regards to treatment, because we now know that COVID is treated with dexamethasone uh, based on the recovery trial. Whether you think that patients who are currently on treatment with um, steroids are at all protected, and this is not only from the sarcoid, but the gen, but the um, uh, in population that is on immunosuppression in general. And um, the second the second question would be whether you think that cardiac sarcoid patients in specific are at higher risk because of myocardial damage. Either, either if this is something which is known and old, uh, or something new that is active. Okay, let, let's do this. I, I was too long the last question, now you've given me two hours, so I'll try not to exhaust all my time. Um, look, immunosuppression means different things according to the level of immunosuppression, that's the first thing. In the sarcoid questionnaire I just showed you, immunosuppression across the board was not associated with an increased risk of hospitalization for COVID. So that's specific to sarcoid. I agree with you. I have from the outset advocated that COVID works in two ways. And you get the direct toxic into the virus, but it sets the immune system off into our auto-inflammatory and autoimmune pathways. And I think the best methadone life-saving effect is about that. I also see that from the arc. And I personally would like a trial as a low dose steroid with the first COVID symptom to be performed because I think these auto inflammatory pathways triggered by the virus might be the key to viral pathogenesis. <coughs> My answer is that at civilized levels of immunosuppression, A, there is no evidence of harm, B, it is perfectly possible that um, low uh, levels of immunosuppression, and by that I mean redness low doses, maybe 50 milligrams or lower, maybe less than 50 milligrams, <coughs> that it is perfectly possible that these are taking the edge off the damage inflicted by the virus by utilizing the immune system. And this may explain why, despite the risk factors, the rate of severe COVID in sarcoid is surprisingly low. And let me go through the general particular. I have no reason or no data to argue that it will be different in cardiac sarcoid. And I think you can break risk here with COVID down to two things. If you've got bad damage in the heart, and we know COVID can set off myocarditis, you will have less so something that is otherwise moderate may become severe. What we don't know is whether if you've got a lot of scar tissue in the heart, COVID is more likely in some way to interact with that and set off myocarditis. We don't know the answer to that, and I, I really can't tell you for sure. What we can say is we certainly haven't seen a wave of problems of that sort at this point. And then it comes down to activity in the heart, and I suggest to you that we, we should actually consider activity in the sarcoid in general, because this could have worked two ways. We could have had an epidemic of severe COVID in active sarcoid, and we didn't. But the other alternative is that you have an activity in the sarcoid, a reduction in the lymphocytes, and if COVID is doing its mischief through the lymphocytes, Maybe to have sarcoid activity isn't such a bad thing. I'm not saying you stop your treatment in order to have active sarcoid, of course. What I am saying is that there are grounds for the reason why active sarcoid might not give you increased risk. And one truth of medicine.
them is that if your immune system is tied up in one illness, it may be less likely to become involved in another. We've seen that in a number of examples. So if some of the pathways of COVID that today gives are tied up in some immune, and again, that may explain why we're not seeing an increased risk in some of the data I've shown you at worldwide experience in active sarcoid with COVID. That does not alter the fact that other factors apply, and nothing I've said should be taken as grounds for complacency or for not getting the vaccine. But I don't think that we have good grounds for an amplified risk in cardiac sarcoid other than the damage to the heart in its own right. Um, the only last question that I have is based on currently as to see um, are the current evidence enough to support the change in their approach? Well, look, I have to break this down. There are circumstances where it's appropriate to issue directives, but there's a less definitive decision making, and all I can say is it's like crossing. Road. So you're in a situation where you can choose to cross the road, dodge the cars, or you can walk 50 yards down to traffic lights and actually cross with the traffic lights and people are, of course, entitled to make those choices. I would have said, based on the data we have, uh, personally, I can't direct people to shield unless they've got the risk factors that sarcoid or not will go with high risk. So, uh, for example, severe damage uh, to organs, comorbidities, and of course, if you're in the age risk group, I think I've got to say to people that they should still view whatever is the average that some people on a post-mission or sarcoid activity could be unlucky and I think, and it's like crossing the road. They actually are at a lesser level of risk of these factors and I think they're entitled to look at their jobs, look at their enjoyment of life, look at the psychological impact of lockdown and make personal judgments just as we don't stand over people and prevent them from crossing the road and dodging the cars. That's at a level where I think people should be allowed to make their own judgment and I think the majority of experience with this message will hear that and feel happy about taking a decision on long term. But it doesn't avoid the main risk factors and some people have to be advised to shield. Thank you very much Prof. Um, I think we better move on to the next speaker and um, I would like to welcome Dr. Sharma, the leading cardiologist uh, in our hospital, but I also think nationally and internationally in cardiac sarcoidosis field. Um, I would like to ask all the um, the attendees to switch off their cameras unless they are talking. Um, so, um, Rakesh, thank you very much for presenting, and we would like to hear the cardiology aspect. So thank you, Mr. Liss, and um, also thank you, Karen Taylor, event organizer, uh, for putting together this fantastic uh, webinar. Um, first of all, just to say that um, a lot of what I'm going to talk about will overlap uh, with Apple Wells, so also you'll be hearing about vaccines and allergies from other world experts. So um, the purpose of my um, kind of talk is just to try and, and set the scene for a discussion. Um, it's all about you, it's all about interaction with yourselves, and we're going to many of which are very pertinent um, to patients with and without cardiosarcoidosis. So I've got a few slides which I'm going to share with you just to help facilitate the discussion. So I'm just bear with me, I'm just going to pick up. Now hopefully you can see my uh, first slide. Um, so when it comes to COVID-19, there's a lot of interest in the interplay with cardiac disease. Um, cardiosarcoidosis obviously is a subspecialist area 
when it comes to chronic disease, but we do know with COVID-19 that some of the more severe complications tend to affect the heart and the vasculature. So I thought I'd start by um, discussing a typical case of a patient who's got chronic sarcoidosis. Um, so this is a 46-year-old lady um, who was diagnosed with chronic sarcoidosis about five years ago when she presented with a cardiac arrest. So she had an ICD implanted and actually did very well and is asymptomatic from the cardiac sarcoidosis perspective, not requiring any expression. Then in March of last year, she developed symptoms of COVID-19. She had a new cough, lack of smell, and she was subsequently diagnosed as having contracted uh, the coronavirus. And it's almost a year now since she was diagnosed, but she still has symptoms of palpitations and profound fatigue. So clearly the question is now whether or not she's got long COVID. So some of the many questions um, prior to this webinar and something which I'm sure we want to discuss is, first of all, um, are patients with chronic sarcoidosis more prone to contracting the virus? Um, Professor Wells has already touched upon this. Secondly, are patients with this disease more likely to have complications post-COVID? I'll just try to expand on something which has already been said by Athol. Uh, but certainly that's one of the uh, concerns that many of our patients have. And the other two questions which may be pertinent are, what are the treatment options that we have? And are there specific treatments for patients with chronic sarcoidosis as compared to the general population? And what is the outcome or the prognosis if a patient with chronic sarcoidosis and contracts COVID-19. There's a, a well-established now interplay between um, the coronavirus and cardiovascular disease. Um, just my own experience, when I was seconded to intensive care um, in April last year, um, one of the um, key factors which stood out was that the patient population being admitted to our intensive care had a very different demographic to what we had been used to prior to the so some of these patients had only very kind of what we call mild cardiovascular disease, such as hypertension, um, and some of the patients were maybe overweight or had diabetes, but we were seeing several patients with quite advanced chronic disease coming to our ITUs. Now this could be a bias, um, obviously at the Brompton Hospital, we are a tertiary cardiac centre, so very often we will get younger patients come to us who maybe need more advanced support in, term, in terms of ECMO and other advanced therapies which are not available elsewhere. But certainly one thing from my own personal experience was that we were seeing patients with relatively few um, comorbidities, but comorbidities such as hypertension and um, diabetes were um, playing a role. Why could COVID-19 um, be more deadly or more serious in these patients? Well, it's probably because of the way the virus interacts with the human body. Um, we know that um, the coronavirus enters um, host cells through a particular receptor called the ACE2 receptor. And this receptor is particularly abundant in not just lung tissue, but also the vasculature and the heart. So again, not to alarm you, but just to kind of explain what can happen in the more severe cases, um, what we are seeing is that patients who are admitted to hospital, certainly to our intensive cares, um, units, some of these patients develop what's called myocarditis. Um, myocarditis, we know, is an inflammatory condition that can occur with a variety of different viral infections and also indeed in chronic sarcoidosis in the active phase of the disease there is a myocarditis. So with COVID-19 some of the more severe cases can develop inflammation in the heart muscle. Arrhythmia is basically a very broad term just to talk about rhythm disturbances that can occur within the heart. This can be either due to a direct toxic effect of the virus on the heart muscle but it can be due to scar tissue which develops, or it can be due to the immune activation which occurs in, in COVID-19 infections, which leads to um, sympathetic activity being higher. So that triggers um, these rhythm disturbances. In long COVID, which is patients who may have had more milder versions of the disease and disease onset, but then have symptoms which are contracted, so many of these patients have palpitations or they are more aware of the heartbeat. And that's mainly because of the green activation leading to increased sympathetic activity. So the body's uh, releasing more hormones, which then drive the heart rate higher, and patients can become aware of the heartbeat, even if the heart is actually otherwise working well. 
What about pre-existing chronic disease? Well, um, patients who have uh, pre-existing coronary artery disease, which is narrowing of the arteries of the heart, certainly immune activation can sometimes lead to what's called plaque rupture. So this is where the, the narrowing of the artery of the heart becomes activated and then there's an acute blockage, um, conventionally known as the myocardial infarct. So certainly we're seeing more of these cases come through. And sadly, some of these patients are presenting late, either because of um, overwhelmed um, services or patients um, being worried about coming to hospital. And in the more extreme um, kind of cases um, in our intensive care, certainly heart failure and, and cardiogenic shock can, can occur. But again, not to worry you, but just to say that these are some of the more extreme cases um, which can um, be due to COVID-19. So there is this interplay with cardiac sarcoidosis, particularly because it's a much rarer condition than cardiac artery disease. We don't have the data at the moment, but certainly from our own experience at the Boston Hospital, and Athol has already mentioned this, and we're not seeing a huge surge of patients with pre-existing chronic sarcoidosis being admitted to intensive care units with um, very severe disease. Now, you don't need me to remind you of the key symptoms of coronavirus. We're all very much aware of these symptoms. And that some of these symptoms may overlap with the symptoms that a patient with chronic sarcoidosis may experience. So how do patients present with chronic sarcoidosis? Well, First thing to say is that patients may have no symptoms whatsoever, and increasingly um, we are being referred patients to our service um, where they may have extra cardiac disease, for example, lung sarcoidosis, and then they have a scan or an ECG done, which then suggests they may be cardiac involvement. So many patients may not have chronic symptoms at all. But the more common mode of presentation really is when patients with um, chronic symptoms present to a clinician and then tests are done to work out whether this is due to a chronic problem. So some of these symptoms, as I said, may actually overlap with coronavirus symptoms, so fatigue, breathlessness, palpitations, but certainly um, if a patient has chronic sarcoidosis and you develop these symptoms, if there's any doubt, then it's important to be tested. Making the diagnosis, well, again, palpitations or rhythm disturbances um, can be a hallmark of both um, severe coronavirus infections and also patients with chronic sarcoidosis, so we do have imaging tools available, or ECG tools available, um, and increasingly um, patients are actually able to buy some of these um, ECG um, monitors themselves, some of which have been um, CE marked, such as the Apple Watch, for example, um, you can get an ECG from that. Um, so certainly there is uh, there are a whole wealth of different modes by which we can try and make the diagnosis when it comes to patients with palpitations. I've talked a little bit about myocarditis. I think it's worth spending a couple more minutes on this particular aspect of COVID-19. As I've said, um, chronic sarcoidosis in its active phase can present with myocarditis or inflammation of the heart. And certainly we've known a lot about myocarditis even prior to the pandemic. But certainly one of the concerns in more advanced disease is where there's either direct um, toxicity from the virus or from the immune activation that takes place, which can lead to swelling within the heart muscle what's called edema, and that can then lead to rhythm disturbances, heart muscle problems, and, and scarring. So it is something which, which certainly needs to be identified, and the cardiac MRI is the gold standard to identify this. And what about symptoms, and, and what can we do for patients who have ongoing symptoms? Well, certainly if myocarditis has been identified, um, the recommendations are based on the individual, so it's not a one-size-fits-all we should try to tailor the, the recommendation based on an assessment of the individual symptoms, their functional status, um, and other comorbidities. And certainly after a diagnosis of myocarditis has been made, we generally tend to recommend in the active phase that patients take rest, so they avoid exercise. And much of this um, evidence actually comes from um, statements such as from the Union of Cardiology, which document that if there's active myocarditis or inflammation of the heart, patients should rest for six months, and they should only return to high level activity once they have been shown to have normal heart function, and that blood test suggests that there's not ongoing myocardial damage. Another um, symptom that some patients can develop, um, particularly patients with the so-called long COVID syndrome, is unsteadiness. And again, this is a symptom which can occur um, in patients who've got um, chronic sarcoidosis or patients who've got heart failure, 
uh, either because of their own condition or because of the medication they're taking. But post-COVID, a lot of patients, um, well, we don't know about a lot, but about 10 to 15 percent of patients post-COVID can develop this symptom of feeling slightly unsteady. Um, and again, this is thought to be due to um, autonomic problems. So this is where uh, the um, function of the sympathetic system and, and parasympathetic system becomes out of kilter. Um, the mainstay of treating um, first of all, education. Um, in the vast majority of these patients, um, things do improve spontaneously and the symptoms are not life threatening. Okay. Core body exercises can actually help improve things and making sure that patients are um, you know, fluid hydrated and uh, they avoid uh, factors which can exacerbate um, this dizziness. So, certain environments, caffeine, alcohol can sometimes exacerbate this. But certainly in the vast majority of cases, we hope that these symptoms are self-limiting. So just to kind of end on this last slide, what we are learning about um, coronavirus and chronic sarcoidosis is, first of all, um, the disease does not appear to be particularly um, deadly in patients with chronic sarcoidosis. It's something which we're learning more about, and we should have more data as we um, progress in terms of our knowledge base. But it's important that if you do have concerns, you do speak to your, your physician. We are here to help you as well. We're here to respond to any concerns you may have. Um, and, and certainly, um, the reassuring factor is that um, if you are taking immunosuppressive drugs, it does appear to suggest that this may be providing a degree of protection um, for more severe types of um, COVID-19 infection. So I think I'll just stop there um, and unshare my screen so I can take questions. Thank you, Rakis. Um, I'm going through the questions that we have been asked. So, um, do you think that patients who are on ACE inhibitors or any other heart failure medications uh, would have any higher risk uh, against COVID? Okay, so very good question. So, um, going back to March of last year, um, there was some concern raised, um, mainly from actually small studies and small observational studies that patients taking ACE inhibitors or angiotensin receptor blockers such as Losartan, the that they may actually be at a higher risk of contracting COVID-19 um, because as I mentioned, the ACE2 receptor is a receptor by which the virus enters cells. However, um, we now have a wealth of data that suggests that this is not the case. And in fact, some observational studies suggest the opposite, that actually patients who already take these medicines either for heart failure or for hypertension there is a degree of protection from coronavirus infection. But certainly the um, recommendations for all, from all the scientific bodies is that you should not discontinue your ACE angiotensin receptor blocker if you're taking it for a medical condition. The reason for should be uh, based on medical need, not because of coronavirus. So these drugs are safe in the pandemic. Thank you very much. And um, my second question is, as we, as it is acknowledged that cardiovascular disease is a risk factor in, for COVID-19 infection, do you think that patients with cardiac sarcoidosis are um, in an excessive risk compared to general sarcoidosis patients? So I think that's a very good question. I think it's a very broad question because, as we know, patients with cardiac sarcoidosis can present a longer spectrum. So you may have some do have just a small amount of fibrosis detected on the MRI scan, but actually they don't have any symptoms, they don't have heart failure, they don't have a defibrillator. So those patients I don't think are at increased risk. On the other end of the spectrum, you may have patients who unfortunately have got heart failure, have got a lot of scar tissue, and I think if they were to contract COVID-19, because there's reduced myocardial reserve, um, in order to try and you know, support the circulation, if a half of a patient is um, subjected to an insult such as coronavirus where they need to uh, maintain a certain cardiac output, they may find that their heart reserve is not as good as someone who doesn't have um, those cardiac security from cardiac sarcoidosis. So I think it's a very broad question. Um, the message to um, our patients is that we need to treat each patient individually. And I think if you have any concerns about your particular involvement of cardiac sarcoidosis, do get in touch with us so we can try and provide more specific advice for your case. But generally speaking, I think as long as the heart function, the systolic function of the heart is preserved, um, I don't think there's increased risk of complications from chronic sarcoidosis per se. 
Thank you very much, Rakesh. Um, I think that would be appropriate to move on to the vaccine section. And I would like to welcome um, Ricardo Jose, who's uh, our consultant in, in Royal Rotom Hospital with immunology background as well as expertise in infectious disease. Um, Ricardo, thank you very much for joining. Um, and we would like to hear your views about the COVID-19 uh, COVID vaccination program. be 
made inside the human cell once this vector, which will carry the vaccine into the cells, arrives there. So if you have the adenovirus common cold vector, it will contain the DNA of the spike protein. Uh, it gets into the cell. Once it gets to the nucleus inside the cell, it will release that DNA into it. And then the, the home cell of the person's body will create the mRNA. What the Pfizer vaccine does is it bypasses that step in that it already delivers the mRNA signature to make the protein directly into the cell. The host cell then will create these um, spike proteins and when the cells within the body, the immune cells recognize it, uh, they will view it as foreign and they will present it to other immune cells in the body which will go on to um, bring in uh, cells to try and fight what is suspected to be an infection but we are just mimicking it with the, with the vaccine. This leads to B cells, which are a type of white cell in the uh, body, coming across the vaccinated cells, expressing the spike proteins. And uh, once it binds to it, it will attach to the other cells that have been exposed to the uh, spike protein and start secreting antibodies. And we'll get what you've probably heard of as IgM and IgG antibodies, which uh, in the future, if one encounters the virus, they can go and bind to the spike protein, blocking it from attaching itself to cells and invading. But also, it can activate other cells, such as T cells, which uh, themselves can attack um, the, the virus if, if, if it's encountered again in the future. When it comes to the dosing schedules uh, for the three vaccines, uh, both of them require two doses, so a first dose and a booster dose. And the clinical trials were done with the Pfizer BioNTech vaccine having a 21 day gap in between first and second dose. And for the Oxford AstraZeneca and the Moderna vaccine, there was a gap of 28 days. So people will ask, is the vaccination safe? Now, vaccines were developed very quickly. The people will be concerned as to how this happened when normally it would take five, seven, ten years before a vaccine comes on to to the market. Um, the good thing was that, for example, with the Pfizer BioNTech vaccination, the technology already existed. mRNA vaccines had been trialed in the same in the setting of cancer therapeutics, so the technology was there. And with the AstraZeneca Oxford vaccine, um, this vaccine had already been developed, trialed in the setting of Ebola, which. Uh, has already received market approval for. So all people had to do was um, identify the signature of the uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus and create the mRNA or the DNA sequence to attach to already existing technology. And as there was a lot of um, high volume of funding and interest and involvement of pharmaceutical infrastructure into this development, it all happened very quickly and um, there was a progress into clinical trials almost immediately and at the same time that people were going on with these clinical trials the vaccine manufacturing was already in development so that once the trials were approved there were batches that could be tested for their safety uh, that, and then could be rolled out immediately and the uk government um, took a bet on these vaccines and ordered a large quantity early on to make them available as soon as the efficacy data was available and um, the vaccine could then be rolled out. Um, the clinical trials were, were large so we've had a sufficient number of participants to determine uh, initial safety and efficacy with the AstraZeneca Oxford vaccine including around 23,000 participants, the Pfizer BioNTech around 44,000 participants and around 30,000 in the Moderna uh, trial. Now, half of the patients would have received a, a placebo or a controlled drug, so usually it would be something like so saline, or in the context of the AstraZeneca vaccine, uh, the control group was the meningitis C vaccination. Um, the rollout has been very successful in the UK, and there's been over 12.5 million uh, vaccinations uh, administered, and these are first doses. So a large number of the population has been vaccinated and um, I think if we were going to see uh, significant um, adverse effects, these would have been uh, uh, alerted to us by now and the MHRA has reviewed uh, this and they continue in sort of a phase four study.
study to evaluate this and they haven't raised any safety uh, signals. Uh, so that, that's all very uh, reassuring. We can see from the table that I've got here at the bottom left, uh, the side effects from the two vaccines. Now these are the most common side effects people will get and that's a bit of arm pain at the site of injection. It's localized, a bit of redness. Uh, about 15 to 17% of people will have a, a fever. Generally it's not a high temperature. Uh, usually ranges around 38 degrees or so. It's not um, something that uh, people are going to, to, to really worry about because it's short-lived. Um, may experience some joint pain, but something that's very common is just the feeling of fatigue and uh, myalgia, also having muscle aches, particularly around the, the sort of uh, upper and lower back. And um, a good proportion of people will also experience some headaches. A lot of people have said they sort of just periorbital around the eyes, uh, almost like a light discomfort. Uh, but overall, uh, nothing uh, significant, and um, you'll hear later about uh, the concern regarding allergies, which uh, Professor Durham will, will address. Another question people have is, um, is the vaccination safe for individuals of Black, Asian, and um, ethnic minorities? And uh, the answer to this is yes. Uh, again, you know, in the post um, clinical trials, surveillance studies, there's not been any indication that uh, there's any difference between ethnicities and adverse effects. And the vaccine, again, has been trialed in a large proportion of uh, individuals uh, who are of ethnic minority. So if you look at the Pfizer BioNTech vaccine, um, even though there's uh, only 9% of individuals who are from Black or or African-American ethnicity, uh, that amounted to close to 4,000 participants, which in the context of a clinical trial is a large number. 4% um, were Asian, 28% Hispanic, and 2% uh, were reported or documented as multiracial. In the AstraZeneca vaccine, uh, if we look at the study from Brazil, 10% of people with black ethnicity, that's around 2,300 participants, 3% were Asian and 20% were mixed race. Uh, is the vaccine effective is the other common question. And uh, the answer is yes. Uh, you've all seen in the media reports of vaccine efficacy uh, around 80, 90% and higher. Um, and that's really great. I think it's much better than what people were expecting when they started off uh, embarking on these trials. If you look at influenza vaccination, yearly the uh, efficacy fluctuates between 40 and 60 percent. Uh, and with these COVID-19 vaccines, we've got much higher um, efficacy, which is, um, which is really, really good. Um, and I think what's important about these vaccinations, as with the flu vaccine, it's not just about protecting people from having symptomatic disease uh, or illness. It, it's about protecting severe disease in high-risk groups of individuals who would otherwise be admitted to hospital, intensive care, and have high mortality. The efficacy of the Pfizer BioNTech vaccine, you can see on this graph on the left-hand side, uh, shows in the, the blue dots those who were given the placebo, so they weren't given the COVID-19 vaccine. And over time, the number of cases uh, increased in a linear uh, fashion, whilst after uh, about 10 days in the vaccine group, the number of reported cases uh, just plateaued. And that just shows how, how effective the vaccine was. And when they do the calculations, they find an efficacy rate of 52% uh, for the Pfizer vaccine between the first and second dose. And uh, seven days after the second dose, the vaccine yeah. efficacy was 95%, which is really high. Uh, with the Moderna vaccine, you see a similar trajectory after having the vaccine. There's uh, very few new cases of COVID-19 with a 94% efficacy 14 days after the first dose. And after the second dose, uh, there's a, again a 94% efficacy, which is maintained. So very good news on the front with mRNA vaccines. When it comes to the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine, uh, the data is also very good and reassuring in that after a few days, once the person has built an antibody response, you see less cases of um, symptomatic COVID-19 being reported. And uh, the AstraZeneca trial was a 
different in some ways because it was done in different arms where in one group people received um, a low dose of the vaccine in the first dose followed by a standard dose as a second dose and in other parts of the trial both first and second dose was the standard dose and what they found interestingly is that if you gave the standard dose to both the efficacy 14 days after that second dose was 62 percent but if they had received a low dose followed by a standard dose you then had an efficacy of 90 percent which was much greater but when they published the trial they pulled the data of the two groups because the low dose standard dose group was very small um, and then they came up with the efficacy of 70 percent uh, which which is good. So for a vaccine to receive FDA approval, it needs to achieve a vaccine efficacy of uh, greater than 50%. Um, but the UK regulatory bodies approved the standard dose, even though that had shown um, a slightly lower efficacy because the low dose standard dose group uh, had very small number of participants to, to justify approving that instead. So, the next question is, what is the evidence for delaying the second dose? Um, early on, the Joint Committee for Vaccination and uh, Immunization, together with the government, made a decision looking at that data that I've just shown you, that it is best to vaccinate as many people as possible and to vaccinate them as quickly as possible to start to create an environment where people are protected and if this vaccine reduces transmissibility of the virus, it will reduce future cases and we'll have control of the vaccine. And this decision was made at a time in December where we were entering a peak of a second wave, which was resulting in the NHS uh, system being overburdened with new admissions. They looked at the Oxford-AstraZeneca vaccine data and in a subgroup of patients from the UK and Brazilian study, some patients had received the second dose at 9 to 12 weeks rather than at the 28 days that had been predefined. And they found that the efficacy of the vaccine after a second dose, if given less than six weeks from the first dose, was 53%. And they had a higher efficacy of 65% if that vaccine was delayed. And Public Health England then took that data and they did their own calculations and looked at between uh, 21 days after the first dose and two weeks after the second dose, and they found an efficacy of 73%. So based on this data, they thought it would be good to delay the vaccine response. And also looking at data from other vaccines that have been uh, given to people, there tends to be a better immune response if the booster is delayed slightly. With the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine, uh, there was a lack of data to make um, the decision on delaying the second dose because the published data showed that um, after the first dose and until people had the second dose, the efficacy was 52%. But JCVI took that data and said, well, if we look at the initial cases of COVID after the vaccine, that's before people built any antibodies. So it's expected that they would acquire um, COVID symptoms if they were exposed. So let's just look at the ones after the first two weeks until they've had a second dose. And there they found that the first dose offered a high efficacy rate of 90%. So they took this all in conjunction to make that decision. Now, more recently, we've got data from the Moderna vaccine, which suggests that 14 days after the first dose, there's 94% efficacy. And this sort of confirms um, the direction that the JCVI took early on with their modeling, um, even though they didn't have full data in front of them to, to justify that decision. So it was very much a public health based decision to try and halt the pandemic. So we have a question about the effectiveness of the vaccine when people are immunosuppressed. And I think has been discussed before when it comes to immunosuppression is that there are varying degrees of immunosuppression. Uh, there's mild, there's severe immunosuppression, and there's also immunosuppression that will affect one part of the immune system and not another. For example, people may have 
a partial antibody deficiency, a full antibody deficiency, or they may have a combined deficiency with B and T cells. And the way the vaccine's immune response works, particularly after a second dose, is that there will be an effect on both of these immune pathways involving B and T cells. And uh, it is expected or presumed based on the biology that there will be some response and having some response is better than having no protection um, towards this um, virus. Now, what it can't be said with certain what the extent of this um, response will be and the extent of the protection because uh, individuals who are immunosuppressed do not take part in clinical trials generally. So, so the data isn't there. Uh, but what we do know more recently from the um, AstraZeneca vaccine, another vaccine that's been trialed in South Africa, which is the Novavax, is that it has been trialed in individuals with uh, HIV infection, which is an immunosuppressive condition. And uh, in those groups, the vaccines, particularly now with the new um, strain of, of uh, coronavirus in South Africa, has shown a reduced efficacy compared to uh, healthy individuals, but the protection was still good. So in the study where they looked at this, there was 60% efficacy in the healthy patients and in the HIV patients, uh, 40%. So people are still getting some degree of protection from the vaccine, even if they are um, immunosuppressed. It may be, and this is purely hypothetical, that the response may be as in people who are older in age, who may take longer to develop immunity. So as been, has been shown with the AstraZeneca vaccine is that whilst um, someone who's young will develop a good antibody response within two weeks, it seems that if you're over 65, it will take about three weeks to develop that similar immune response. Uh, and then we don't know yet how long the vaccine is going to be protective for, uh, but we do know that in people of more advanced age, there's more waning of the immune response over time. And again, that may be the case in people who are on immunosuppressive medication, uh, but we need more data to come as we assess uh, things in the real world uh, that will give us an opportunity to provide you with some uh, data to, to justify these responses. But overall, I think that some protection is better than no protection. And what's also very important to remember is that to date, we do not know what the correlate of protection to prevent severe disease is in COVID-19. So we do not know what level of antibody and T cell response is needed for the body to prevent severe disease. Um, one of the questions I th we were asked is, um, how can we ensure immunocompromised individuals have vaccine-related immunity? Now, in the ideal setting, one would want to measure antibody responses, T cell responses, but it's just not feasible. Um, it would be conducting tests on a very large population of individuals. And as I said, because we do not know what the correlates of protection are, it does not mean that someone with a low antibody response on a test in the lab would suggest that that person would go on to develop severe disease compared to someone who had a much higher antibody response. So without having data to support investigations of that nature in all people, um, it's currently not justified. But it's important, as I said, to monitor real world data now that we've had 12.5 million people vaccinated, many of those over the age of 80 and 70 and those who are clinically extremely vulnerable. And the data that's been coming out of uh, Israel and data that will be coming out from Public Health England, so far what's been in the media is very, very reassuring um, that these vaccines are working and they're not only working with the first SARS-CoV-2 virus that was identified last year, but also with the Kent variant that's come up in the UK. And even though the data suggests there might be slightly lower efficacy towards the South African variant, um, there is still efficacy there and there's uh, nothing of indicating that we should have concerns um, about this vaccine's efficacy at this time. 
what I would say as well is that I think it's important to ensure that when your household contacts are offered vaccination, now a lot of them will be healthy and younger, so they may not be in the JCVI categories of prioritization to receive their vaccines right now, but as the program rollout has been so great and rapid, people will get offered their vaccines later in this year and they should certainly take up that um, opportunity. And then ultimately, these vaccines, even though they offer such high degree of efficacy, you know, we're talking about numbers of 95%, 90%, we still have to remember that it's not 100% guaranteed that it will prevent severe disease in everyone. So we still have to, for now, continue to follow social distancing guidelines and government shielding advice. Um, if people have been listed in those uh, groups until we know more and have uh, control of this um, pandemic. But certainly the vaccines are um, our hope for the future in limiting the pandemic to a point where we will be able to lift a lot of the restrictions that have currently been put in place for a lot of people, including people in this um, in this audience. Um, I think people will want to know about choice of vaccine and should they be given that opportunity? And it, it's, it's really a difficult question because it's almost in some ways philosophical. It's about ethics. Um, my personal view is if there wasn't such a huge demand on the need for the vaccine and to vaccinate a lot of people quickly, uh, yes, people should be given a choice because with every treatment, you need to make an informed decision about what the benefits are, what the adverse effects are, and um, consent to this process. But we have to remember that we are in a pandemic with a disease that's causing a high mortality, and the priority of the government is to make sure everyone gets a vaccine quickly. So the vaccines can't be produced at such high rates. So the government is relying on several vaccine manufacturers coming through with stock and therefore offering out to people. And unless there are specific contraindications, such as you'll hear about later with allergy uh, to one vaccine, um, and because the vaccine efficacy and adverse effect profile is so similar between all these vaccines, um, there, there isn't a choice. Um, and that's where we, we stand at the moment with that. Now, I'm happy to take any, any more questions. And once again, apologies for the initial uh, issue with the slides. Thank you very much, Ricardo. I think um, it was a great talk. Um, can I ask you, um, we had a very interesting question from the audience. What would your comment be about um, stopping methotrexate if a patient is on immunosuppressive, a on this immunosuppressive agent or overall methotrexate azathioprine second line or steroid sparing agents? What about your views about stopping it for a few weeks to allow uh, the patient to have uh, a better response uh, after being vaccinated? Um, I I personally don't think that uh, measure is is required because as I said, we do not know exactly what the um, immune response will be in individuals who are immunosuppressed. We know that in patients uh, with sarcoidosis and other patients with uh, immune deficiency that they do have uh, beneficial vaccine responses. In sarcoidosis, studies have been done looking at vaccine responses to the influenza vaccine, and there's nothing there to suggest they respond differently from uh, their healthy controls. Um, I would think that um, the way the program is being rolled out, one wouldn't want to delay the opportunity to take up a vaccine, particularly when the supply is low. And in order to improve immune function related to suppression from a drug, you would not have 
that vaccine, oh, sorry, that immune response improving within days or a week or two. Um, so I, I think the risk of decompensating current treatment with the immunosuppression a patient on uh, isn't warranted. Thank you. Um, the the question that I would like to ask you, um, we will get a high demand of patients that would like to know whether they are immune or not. And for example, we have followed the strategy in starting high level of immunosuppression to patients that have been vaccinated. Do you think that there is a role in performing antibody testing or T cell uh, um, lymphocyte subset measurement um, to make sure that they have got uh, um, immunity or not? Um, I, I, I don't think that uh, is warranted. Uh, the reason being that if you measure someone's antibody response and they have, say, a certain level of neutralizing antibody, which is low, it doesn't mean they're going to be less protected than when the antibody level was higher. We do not know what the correlate of protection is to prevent severe disease. So I think the key uh, is to, to have the vaccination. There will be some response, even if it's not as good as what one would expect in a healthy control. But looking at the data in people over the age of 65, for the AstraZeneca vaccine, the numbers in the previously published trials have been small. That's why it's been difficult to make conclusions, but there shouldn't be a reason that they are different from the other vaccine responses. And uh, there's been no major difference in vaccine response in an 80 year old compared to a 50 year old uh, with this virus, at least in the short term. So but looking at the, the key here is to in just have over the, vaccine, the age of 65, and I suspect that in the future, for the AstraZeneca vaccine, there may be a need the for numbers in the previously published trials, not in everyone, small, that's at why least in high risk make groups, groups similar to what we have. But in there the shouldn't flu. be a reason that they are different from the other vaccine responses. And uh, there's been thank you very much. Um, I because of the time limits, I will I would like to proceed with. Prof. Durham, who's um, uh, a leading physician in allergy in the country, part of uh, a member of that took part in the decision making around the contraindications uh, around vaccines, COVID-19 vaccines. So um, I will share my screen with his slides. Prof. Durham, I would like to welcome your views regarding the safety of COVID-19 COVID vaccines regarding the allergy point of view and thank you very much for joining uh, even at the last minute that I've asked you. It's a uh, first of all, can you hear me Vasilis? Yes, yes. Good, yes. Um, I haven't actually seen uh, the my slides yet. Um, yes, excellent. OK, thank you very much. I've just actually um, included two slides. Uh, well, first of all, thank you very much indeed for inviting me. It's a great pleasure to talk to um, a broad audience of uh, sarcoidosis uh, patients and it's been a pl pleasure and a privilege for me to work closely with uh, your team in, in looking at upper airway problems and nasal problems in patients with uh, sarcoidosis. But that's not what I'm here to talk about today. It's the vaccine. I've got my allergy hat on and I think there are um, a couple of uh, major points that I want to make. Uh, and that is really just to reinforce what we've already heard from Dr. Sharma and also from from our colleague from uh, infectious diseases. And that is that uh, patients with sarcoidosis are at risk and they should receive the COVID-19 vaccine as soon as it's available for them. And as we've just heard, um, this really does include patients who are on immunosuppressants in the sense that they are more at risk of uh, COVID-19 and even if there may be a partial impairment in the response and that's not known, we've just heard some very reassuring comments about a good response to patients and immunosuppressants to the flu vaccine for example. So that's really my main message and allergy is a very very small part of this. 
And now we've got the collective experience of 13 and a half million uh, vaccinations uh, in this country, the vast majority of which, of course, would have been the, uh, the, Pfizer, uh, Astra, uh, the, the Pfizer vaccine. Um, and they're extremely safe. And so my, my main message is here, I've just put down here under number two, uh, you, you must all consider having the vaccine and having it as soon as possible. Um, allergic reactions to the COVID-19 vaccines are extremely rare. And patients with common allergies, that is with hay fever or asthma or food allergy can have the COVID-19 vaccines very safely with no increased risks. So if you have peanut allergy, where you have what we call an IgE antibody to the peanut, which is causing anaphylaxis, for example, um, you can still have the COVID vaccine because that's a very highly specific immune response that it's not going to affect your response to the uh, COVID. Uh, uh, you're not going to be at increased risk with the COVID vaccine. And in fact, just looking at this, patients with hay fever and asthma, uh, which is commonly associated with uh, food allergy, in fact, paradoxically, these patients are protected. Um, there's been no increased expression or severity of disease in patients with bronchial asthma, allergic asthma, or hay fever. And there's studies from our group that show that actually patients with hay fever and asthma have a much lower expression of the ACE2 protein, which is the receptor for the COVID-19 uh, virus on the, on the surface of cells within the respiratory epithelium. So it's not that not only are patients with allergies, um, they're not only they're not at increased risk, they're actually at decreased risk of either getting the, of getting the virus in the first place. And so that, that's an important point. And that as far as the vaccine is concerned, this does not uh, increase their risk of developing an allergic reaction to the vaccine, which is a highly specific event and independent to their own allergies. And as I wish to emphasize, this is not just patients with common allergies, even if you have anaphylaxis and the cause is known and it's nothing to do with vaccines. And we're talking about severe but not uncommon reactions to penicillin or peanuts or wasp stings, for example. There's no reason why if you have anaphylaxis to a wasp sting that you cannot have uh, the vaccine safely. So th those are really the main messages. So please have the vaccine when offered to you. And if you have allergies, uh, this is not a concern in the vast majority of cases. Now, uh, if I can move on to slide two, uh, Vasilis, or do I have control? Just if you just click no, the no. slide. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. This is slide two. Yes, OK, yes. Now, the second the second point that I want to make is so. So what are what's what's this rumpus about anaphylaxis and COVID-19 vaccines? I'm going to show the first slide at the end, by the way, as well as uh, discussing the second slide. The only exceptions to where you cannot have the Pfizer COVID vaccine are in patients who are allergic to a compound called PEG. And PEG, if you look at the bottom line here with the asterisk right at the bottom of the page, you can see that uh, PEG stands for polyethylene glycol, and it's the excipient, that is what we call the binding agent in the Pfizer vaccine. And it's, it, it's highly likely that it, it, it is this that is responsible for the very rare cases of anaphylaxis that have occurred with the Pfizer COVID-19 vaccine. Now, allergy to PEG, which is contained within the vaccine, is extremely rare. Um, it's contained in some uh, biologic uh, compounds. I, I was actually looking last night. Interestingly, it's not contained in the uh, uh, immunos um, the uh, antibodies, the biologics that are generally used for, for uh, treating sarcoidosis, for example. The infliximab and the rituximab uh, are, um, do not contain PEG. But there are certain biologics that contain PEG, and that's fine. You, if you've had them and you've had no problem, then you can have the COVID vaccine. It's only if you've had an allergic reaction to PEG-containing vaccines, which is extremely rare, um, that you would be at risk of a, an adverse effect to the Pfizer vaccine. And I suppose that the other cause that we have to concede, and this was 
uh, put out by the MHRA, and I, I do have some sympathy for this, and that is that if you've had severe anaphylaxis, and I'm not talking about any form of mild allergy, but I'm talking about um, you know a, a life-threatening uh, fall in blood pressure, uh, respiratory compromise, generalized rash, all the features we associate with life-threatening anaphylaxis, and, and we don't know the cause, then of course it's possible that could be due to PEG. And in that context, so unexplained severe anaphylaxis is uh, a relative contraindication to the Pfizer vaccine. And that's the only situation, in fact, where I would recommend going for the Oxford vaccine, the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine when it becomes available, if one had the choice. And that is where you're suspecting PEG allergy or if you've got a case of anaphylaxis, not just allergy, mild reactions, but a case of anaphylaxis to, um, uh, you know, due to due to PEG, then, uh, sorry, if, if you've had anaphylaxis and the cause is unknown, then that would be a reasonable, uh, it, the decision would be to take the AstraZeneca uh, vaccine rather than the Pfizer vaccine. And that's really the, the main points uh, that I want to make, um, that this, the, the, all the vaccines are effective and safe. Um, the, the scenario would hasn't come up for, for most, or well, which could come up for some patients, of course, but now the government has uh, stalled the second vaccine. There will be a very small minority of patients who do actually get an allergic reaction to the Pfizer vaccine. Um, this has been extremely, extremely uh, rare. And the question arises then is, well, should they have the second dose of the Pfizer vaccine? And the answer is, if they've had a mild reaction to the Pfizer vaccine, then there's no harm at all in them having a second dose of the Pfizer vaccine. And this should be done under supervision. And we're talking about a mild skin reaction, for example, erythema or a nettle rash, um, which subsides without requirement for treatment, then they can have the same vaccine. Although the recommendation is that you should wait for half an hour after the second vaccine. And it's only patients who have a moderate or severe reaction to the Pfizer where a, a likely cause is due to the polyethylene glycol excipient that's contained within the vaccine, then that would be uh, an indication for having the Oxford uh, vaccine for the second dose where you'd be mixing vaccines, which is not ideal because we don't have data to support that. But uh, essentially, uh, these are the uh, views that I have. Uh, and these are actually the views that are actually being published recently by the MHRA. They have changed and I've reviewed the website and the green book in the last uh, couple of days. And so this is it. Um, uh, very safe, uh, very effective, as we've heard from Jose. And uh, this is, you know, all very good news. So I think perhaps we could go back, go back to the first slide, um, or maybe I can just show the first slide because I don't want to leave you with the, no, no. the, wrong, the wrong message. There, there we are. And that is you should all have the vaccine. It's extremely safe. If you've got any form of allergy, if anything, it's it's protective against the disease in terms of the ability yeah. of the virus to bind to your cells. And that um, even if you've got uh, uh, either common allergies or an anaphylaxis to a known cause, which is not a vaccine, then you can have the vaccine safely. And that's the message I want to leave you with. So thank you very much for having that opportunity, Vasis. I'll hand it back to you for any questions that you may have. Thank you very much, Prof. I think um, I think that what you actually said is very clear. Um, I, I, I personally do not have any question about mm -hmm. it. Um, but if, if a member of the audience does have, then um, I will pass this to you. Uh, okay. Thank you very much for contributing. It's a pleasure, pleasure. to have you. Thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you. Um, I must say that um, I had prepared um, a, a quick talk, um, although the majority, I think, of the themes have been covered, and I don't want this to be more than um, uh, one and a half hours for everyone's um, uh, commitments. I will just mention a few things from my talk, um, which is basically regarding our service. And I will say that this is a, a unique service trying to join the cardiology and the sarcoidosis expertise in a, with, an MD, with a multidisciplinary approach that is primarily uh, patient-centered and consultant-led. Um, we try to respond as, as better as we could uh, during this pandemic, although there were a number of challenges. 
and we had to change a lot in our communication, treatment decisions, monitoring decisions, but overall we tried not to change our ethos um, in with regards to the diagnosis and um, management of the cardiac sarcoidosis population. You can see that our numbers continue to increase despite the pandemic. And um, what we have done is that we we are now communicating with you remotely. We don't unfortunately we don't have many face to face appointments yet. Um, we try to increase our capacity so that we can be close to you, although I think that this can be challenging. Um, we continued our imaging services for urgent and necessary cases, and we have our ambulatory care unit at Fulham Road for intravenous treatments. We try to increase our network with local teams so that they can participate in our MDT and can uh, uh, have direct communication with us. These risk factors were, were mentioned by Prof Wells, which we are taking into account when deciding about treatment. And our main statements are we don't really want to have any significant change in patients uh, treatment unless this is necessary. We would like to reduce the overall level of steroids um, as, as, a, as a, a maintenance treatment. We try to avoid treating patients with intravenous or anti TNF um, during the peaks, although some patients had to receive that and we um, followed our practice of multidisciplinary approach for active cardiac sarcoidosis patients um, uh, diagnosed during the pandemic. So my main my main point is that I think that we need to identify ways of returning back to normality, but also to develop novel pathways of communication. And I would like to welcome everyone's input in that after the after the end of this meeting you will receive um, a questionnaire where you can let us know how often you would like to repeat events like these ones i know that this event did not include general cardiac sarcoidosis information but it did focus on the pandemic and the vaccination um, i think that we need to have um, access to effective medications for the COVID-19 infection. If they, if if there are any studies supporting that, we need to um, strongly engage with the vaccination program. Have no real uh, thoughts against vaccines uh, because they are a, a path. They are helping to our pathway towards a new normality. From our end, we need to focus on research studies to better understand the risk of benefits of immunosuppression because COVID is going to be here with us and is going to be for long. Um, we need to continue with our international collaboration and communication so that we can update you uh, even from other centers experience. And um, I've, I've, I've been trying to identify ways of establishing um, a better accessibility for patients, both for information, education, um, so you are aware um, or most of you are aware of um, some attempts that I have made and we are waiting for a reply by the Brompton Trust regarding developing a smartphone application for education. Um, we are trying to access remote rehabilitation courses for you and see whether there are any devices that could help us with your remote monitoring. So all of them um, are ways to come closer to you, which is my main target and um, the whole cardiac sarcoidosis team is trying to uh, focus on that. Um, I would like to know what you think. I would like to know what do you want and how we can help you. Um, and these events are in that target. Um, I want to thank Sarcoidosis UK for promoting the event, but also helping us on a day to day basis. We uh, have promised to um, um, uh, bring another event for the general sarcoidosis population um, in April, which you will be informed about. And keep calm and do know that we are here for you. Thank you very much. I'm just seeing in the chat line that um, a member of, of, of the participants have mentioned that some of the patients are not in priority four group, um, which I don't really know why, 
um, any patient having such problems should be uh, should be approaching us. We have listed all our patients in the extremely vulnerable group group um, from our trust. So if there are any issues with the local GPs or anyone, we would be happy to help. Karen, are you? Would you like to thank you very much, Karen, for all the help that you've done to um, hold this event? Um, and I would like to you to give us um, a closing point. From my end, the only thing that I would like to say is that a way of keeping us closer would be to subscribe to the Brompton newsletter uh, so that we can have your email addresses for future contact. Um, and uh, I will try to be close to you as much as we can. Looking forward for a better future. Thank you so much, Basilis. I thought it was a really great event, um, particularly you know, how you've been able, you and your colleagues have been able to respond to patients' questions. Um, what we'll do afterwards, we'll send an email to thank everybody for attending and we'll reshare the link to the survey where we're going to ask for um, patients to give us their feedback. It's very much an opportunity to um, tell us what you need and what sort of support that, that you would like us to deliver. Um, so your um, involvement in that would be really helpful. Um, some of you who filled in the, the pre-event questionnaire also gave us your contact details because you're interested in patient and public event and activities. So what we will do is we will share your contact details with Nancy Dickinson and she runs the Foundation Trust membership. And that's a great forum for understanding and getting to know um, more work just across the hospitals more generally. But I would like to thank um, the whole team here and thank you all so much for coming in your time today. So thank you so much. Bye bye everyone. Thank you very much, Karen. Thank you. Bye. I'm going to stop the recording, the recording. and close this meeting for everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.